subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Good day, our lovely viewers and cherished students watching from the comfort of your home or our school. You are welcome to SHSR on Joy Learning TV. Today's topic is safety precaution in the laboratory, taken from SHS 1 Integrated Science. I'm going to be your facilitator, Osei Kwame Amwateng. I hope you are ready for the journey through this nice and lovely topic. At the end of our lesson today, you, the students, should be able to follow basic safety precautions in the laboratory and also identify and interpret hazardous symbols. I hope you are ready. Let's begin. Have you ever gone to the kitchen before trying to cook? Or have you observed those chefs at the restaurant kitchen cooking? What do you think can injure them or injure them in their quest of cooking for us? If you are cooking and mistakenly you are boiling rice and it's boiling and you try to open it immediately and try to take something, what comes out? Steam. What would the steam do to your hands? What about the mechanics? They are sometimes under the car trying to fix something. What is the potential problem they can face? What about footballers? They play football, they get injuries, broken bones, twisted knees, whatever, head battered. So everybody's job comes with some danger. The military protectors and they're in danger of a gunshot every job even the doctor's job he also has problems he also have potential uh, issues of a disease or something he can pick up so it means that no job is free even the media a teacher talking too much with the voice or working in the lab as a science teacher we all face some hazards the question would be, what is the difference between a hazard and an accident? Most times you say that there's a car accident. There's a car accident. But when buildings collapse, we don't, most we don't call it accident. We just say a building that has collapsed. So in our field of science, there's a difference between a hazard and an accident. We describe a hazard or maybe define a hazard as any condition or act that has a potential danger and can result in an accident. Listen to it well. A condition or an act that has a potential danger doesn't mean it has caused the problem. It can. It can trigger it or cause it. Once that action takes place, then we say it's now an accident. So we define an accident as any occurrence that causes harm an injury to life and property or the environment. So there are two ways there. There's harm and injury to your life and property or the environment. So sometimes you may, you the individual may not be hurt. If you drive your car to knock down a billboard or break somebody's wall, you've destroyed somebody's property. That's also an accident. You uh, mistakenly leave your laptop and it falls down and maybe falls on your glass table you've destroyed a property so it can also be an accident but now let's narrow it down to our job our field you the student myself because every student in the shs or at least not less than once visit the laboratory for interscience you have a lot of experiments to do so we are concentrating our experiment our Accident or hazards limited to the lab, not the mechanic, not the doctor, not the chef or the policeman. So let's highlight 
some few words, potential danger that can cause accident is the hazard. Then the one that causes harm and injury to your life, which is key and property or the environment. So mistakenly, somebody will set, uh, will just smoke and leave a piece of the smoke down and cause it or catch fire. It's an accident though, but it's caused damage to the environment. So I want you to change your mentality about accident be a car accident. Now, any measure you take to avert or to prevent or to avoid, any of these words, to avert, to prevent, to avoid is the same thing. A likelihood of the accident occurring. So it's not like you let the accident occur and protect yourself. You make sure that you even prevent the accident from occurring. Once you do that, that becomes a precaution. But if you're already in the accident, you are protecting yourself, that is not a precaution. You take precautions before the accident takes place. And you don't take it proud to the accident. Let's say you are driving and you know that this car is going to enter a ditch, so I'm putting on my seat belt or something. No. But proud to starting to drive from the house, you envisage that it's possible that somebody can knock into my car, my car can go into a ditch or meet head along with another car. So you first start protecting yourself. If you're a motor rider, you put on your helmet or your gear to protect. You don't wait when you see danger coming. Probably that has been our attitude. Now, safety measures depend on the field you find yourself in. In some companies, let's say the oil rig, they put as a law. Those in the building construction, it's a law and it's a regulation. And sometimes they have inspectors going around to check what they do. To put on your head gear, your ear piece to protect your ear from damage, your nose marks, everything. So that becomes a law or regulation and conventions. Before I go on, have you gone to the mall before? Sometimes you go to the mall, you see people mopping the floor. Not that they are happy to keep that only away. It could be that somebody spills something. And mistakenly, you can also step on it and fall. And that may cause trouble to them. In that case, the mopping is a precaution. So we would want to take our time and go through the basic precautions you as a student and myself as a science teacher should take in the laboratory. When you enter my laboratory, please do the following. Don't take it for granted. The first precaution or safety rule will also give you a reason is that do not eat or chew food substances in the laboratory. I don't hand pick on anybody, but some of you like eating biscuits a lot. You packet biscuits and you bring it to the lab. Once you are not around or we turn right in, then you try to put one in your mouth. Rather, we say do not eat when you enter our laboratory. Why? You could ingest food or drink water which is contaminated that could cause you harm first don't bring it and to when you see something in our lab don't eat it don't put it in your mouth unless you've asked permission don't even do it because you don't know what could be in it it could be exposed chemicals could have fallen on it uh, bacteria could have fallen on it so we said that don't try to eat because you may eat something that is contaminated in the lab two it doesn't make sense the next point do not walk barefooted in the laboratory yes they are saying nobody actually goes but some students are fan of those wearing slippers or something once they sit down they remove their legs from their foot from their shoes and you see them trying to walk to pick something just behind them don't try that because mistakenly you may step on a broken equipment or material and get hurt. Somebody could have spilled maybe hot acid on the floor. So to the extent that even the kind of shoes you are supposed to wear in the lab, we have specific types. 
If you come to my lab, there are basic precautions. Every lab in the SHS, there are basic precautions you should take, which include the first two. If the next two, two is that do not enter and perform any activity without wearing the appropriate wear. Full shoe, hand gloves, goggles, nose mask, etc. Let me show you a set of these things. You have your lab coat you are supposed to put on. You have your goggles to put on. And you have your hand gloves to wear. These are basic things you should have. Don't get angry if your lab teacher or master insists every student should have this. It's for your own good. Have you noticed at the hospital, our beautiful ladies or nurses always wear some white shoes? Ghana, we call it kambu. Have you wondered why? And they put on socks. Yes, that's a standard thing you are supposed to wear. If you wear your lady slippers or half shoe, and assuming a hot liquid or corrosive acid pours on your leg, what will you do? Your shoe, which is half shoe, cannot protect you. So we say that enter a lab wearing the appropriate gear. You may sit on a, a table or a stool with acid on it. To burn your dress and your skin, it will first burn the lab coat. Your hands should not, be contam should not get contaminated when you come to the lab. So you wear your gloves so that you touch everything wearing these gloves. Once you remove it or so, you have to dispose it off. You don't bring it back the next time. This is to protect all these gear or things we wear. is to protect the body from danger by direct contact to the body. None of the things you do should touch you. Should not even get contaminated to your dresses so that when you go, you are safe. Next. You, the student, should always make sure when you get to the lab, the place is neat. You keep the place clean, tidy. Before you start, during and after. You are fond of the habit of don't want to work and you don't want to clean as you are going. When you finish, you are in a hurry to leave and for who to wash. There is a reason to avoid spillage, or sorry, to avoid slipping. Then also to avoid death. Death can contaminate what you do the next time. And makes your equipment dirty and you can't use it unless you waste time. So what we do in the lab is that keep the place tidy. Once you come in, dust the table. If the equipment are dirty, wash it before it starts. And when you are done, wash it, turn it up so that it dries. But mostly we keep the whole place tidy so that things that are broken, you can sweep it immediately. Liquid that uh, spills off onto your table or the floor, use a mop or a duster to clean immediately so that you avoid you from slipping or sometimes damaging your dresses. Another basic precaution is wear rubber gloves when handling strong acid. Maybe you may have dilute acid. I said the best is don't touch things with your hand. But we get to go with iodine, which is not any dangerous thing. So people just use their hand to touch it. But when it comes to strong acid, when they've written concentrated acid on it, please don't touch it with your bare hands. You may not know if there has been any spillage along or around the glass, which if your hand touches, it can burn or corrode your hand. The next, you are fan of do opening taps and leaving them. Usually, if the tap is not flowing and you go there, you turn it and you say that, oh, it's not flowing. Then sometimes you leave it and go. In the evening, they may turn the taps on. Before you come the next day, the whole place is flooded. So it means that when you come to our lab, just be observant, be cautious, and be attentive. Do not open a gas tap also before looking for a match to light the benzene burner. Yes, it's like kitchen. They are saying that don't put, turn on the gas before you say, I'm going to look for the matches and come and light it. No, before you do that, boom, 
the whole place will catch fire. Because once you open a gas, the place will have a diffusion of the gas in there. And you remember, you have other friends, plus yourself, plus the teacher there. So get your matches first before you put your whole Benson burner thing together. Let one person open it for you and stand at the other end and light it on. If you are not sure that it didn't come, put off your light, check it well before. That's why mostly we also open Benson burner close to where there's a source of air, near the windows or a place that's airy. The reason is that the gas will leak into the surrounding air and lighting a match afterward will cause the gas to inflame or fire outbreak in the lab. And there's mostly usually one door to the lab. So who will run first? Now, let's look at chemicals. Let's take our time to look at how we work with chemicals. Some of our experiments will require you to use your senses to identify certain chemicals. We call it qualitative analysis. Qualitative means not quantity, not numbers. Description. Use your sense to look at the color, maybe the texture, the smell. And because of that, the smell, you are supposed to bring... The, the most what people do is when you have a perfume, they just want to inhale it. No. What we do is that we take our test tube back and try to find a little close to your nose, some distance away. If it's here, the way you can smell a good perfume, the same distance, you can do this and you can smell it. Because an unknown gas, the reason why you're doing that, unknown gas could be harmful to your body. You may not know what is in it. So in our lab, we keep saying, follow instructions. Don't be too curious to do what you want. One basic rule to is that do not pour water into acid, but rather pour acid into water. It's because of some density and some.